So it was just about this time of year, September, five years ago. And I was doing something that I would not wish on anyone in this room. I was testifying before Congress. And one thing that'll make you feel better about talking to lawyers is having to go and talk before Congress. And the subject that morning was the state of religious freedom in America. And that morning I knew something that nobody else in the room knew. We had kept it out of my written text and everything else, which was that as I was speaking, Hobby Lobby and the Green family were filing a lawsuit in federal court to protect their own religious freedom. Many of you are probably familiar with the story of Hobby Lobby. David Green and a friend took out a $300 bank loan so that they could buy a saw and they set up in a garage and started manufacturing these little frames that people could paint. And from the very beginning, Hobby Lobby was a family business. David was making the frames. His wife, Barbara, was shipping out all the mail orders. Their two young sons would actually glue the frames together at the kitchen table in exchange for money to buy baseball cards. And from the beginning, Hobby Lobby was a business that was run and built on faith. The mini frames became one store in Oklahoma City, and one store became two. And by the time I was speaking that September morning, Hobby Lobby was a nationwide chain with more than 500 stores across the United States. Hobby Lobby was and still is owned by the Green family, David, Barbara, and their now adult children. Hobby Lobby, the Green family, has always fought to run Hobby Lobby in a way that's in accordance with their faith. Hobby Lobby is closed on Sundays. Now, that's a pretty risky step for retail, but the Greens would tell you that after they took that chance, after they stepped out on faith, their business actually improved. Hobby Lobby's employees now have Sundays free to spend with family, to worship if they choose. They also have more time in the evenings. Hobby Lobby's only open for 66 hours a week. When you're shopping there, you'll probably notice the hymns that are being played in the background. They have an instrumental music track that's created just for Hobby Lobby uh, that uses religious music. You can find religious items in the store. Hobby Lobby does some other unusual things too. They pay, they start their employees at double the minimum wage because the Greens believe that that's the right thing to do. Uh, and most relevant for our case, Hobby Lobby provides its employees with excellent health care. If you visit their headquarters in Oklahoma City, you'll see there's a pair of doors where you walk in for the main entrance for the corporate offices. And then two doors down, there's another set of doors and you walk in there and it's a medical clinic. There's actually a doctor and several nurses on premises there, and Hobby Lobby employees can go and get medical care free of charge. They also have access to chaplains, to conflict resolution courses, to financial peace courses. This is something that the Green family provides. No employee has to take advantage of those things, but if they want them, they're there. The, Green did, the Greens did these things not just because it's good business, although they would tell you that it is, but because they believe in demonstrating their faith in the way they run Hobby Lobby. Our federal government had other ideas. In 2011, the bureaucrats at Health and Human Services, just a little ways down the street from where I work, did the thing that bureaucrats do. They took some vague language in the Affordable Care Act and they used it to set a new nationwide policy. Starting the following year, insurance plans like Hobby Lobby's would have to cover the full range of FDA approved contraceptives and this included things like the morning after pill and the week after pill. These are drugs that the FDA and their manufacturers admit can terminate an embryo after the moment of conception. So now Hobby Lobby had a choice. They had long excluded abortion from their insurance policies. And so now they had to figure out what to do. They could comply, say nothing about it, just change their policies, who would ever know? They could keep the same excellent insurance plan that they have and pay $475 million a year for that privilege. They could drop insurance that their employees depended on and still pay more fines to boot. 
Or they could do something that they never imagined they would do. They would file a lawsuit against the federal government asking the courts to protect their exercise of religious freedom and how they ran their family business. They chose Beckett to represent them in that case and I was honored to work on it from the very first day until the very last. At Beckett, we represent people of all faiths. We believe that that's the best way to guarantee religious freedom. And today I want to tell you as an attorney why that case matters, why it's good for the law. But I also want to speak personally and tell you what that case has meant for me, the lessons that I learned in that fight, lessons that I hope will encourage and inspire you as well. <clears throat> when we filed the case in September, we had until January 1st to get a win. Those $475 million would start to accrue on January 1. And so we went to court and we asked them for an order that would protect Hobby Lobby just as long as their case was going on and working its way through the system. We did that in September, we had until January 1st. We got the ruling a few days before Thanksgiving. We lost. I was on my way to Texas with my family. I found myself sitting in a hotel room, writing an emergency appeal late at night, trying not to wake up my husband and daughter. We uh, went to the appeals court here in Denver and asked them for an emergency order before January 1st to protect Hobby Lobby. And two weeks later, they denied it. And so we did our last ditch effort. We filed a petition with Justice Sotomayor at the Supreme Court. She's the one who hears emergency petitions when they come from this appeals court. Uh, incidentally, it's the same kind of thing you file for a death row inmate when you're trying to stave off an execution. We asked her for a stay, and on December 26th, she denied that. It was a tough Christmas. It was a tough Christmas for us, and more so for the Green family. They gathered together in a living room, whole family, three generations now, and they had to discuss what they should do. They did something really unusual. They started with the youngest, and the question on the table is, what do we do? Do we comply? Do we continue, knowing the fines are going to bankrupt this business that we spent 40 years building? What do we do? And from the youngest all the way to the oldest, the family agreed. They had to follow God, and they had to trust in Him. And that's the first point I want to take from this story. Sometimes when you set out to follow God, you lose. We like to envision a straightforward path to victory. I know that I went into this case convinced that we were going to win the entire thing. But faith is built in the moments when the outcome isn't clear. Scripture tells us what? That faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We did not see the outcome that Christmas. But with the courage of our clients, we all kept going. The Greens were asked to put it all on the line, and they did, even when it seemed certain to fail. It's a pattern that I have seen since. Our greatest victories are made possible after defeat. Each of Beckett's five Supreme Court victories has come after a heart-wrenching loss. You'd think that the Little Sisters of the Poor would be the one client that couldn't lose their case, right? And they lost twice. It's often the surprise loss that makes it necessary to take a bold step and to fight harder for victory. We did get a reprieve that Christmas. We learned about a lawyer's favorite thing, a little technical thing in the law that would delay the fines by an additional six months. It was one time. That was all we had. There were going to be no more second chances. We had to win. So we went back to the appeals courts and we did something bold. We asked all nine judges who sit on the Court of Appeals here in Denver uh, to hear Hobby Lobby's case. They had to fly in from all the states in the Tenth Circuit and come to a special session and sit together as one court just to hear Hobby Lobby's case on an emergency basis. This was so unusual that when we were trying to write the motions for it, we had a hard time even finding an example of where they'd done it before. But on Good Friday, they agreed. And they all flew here to Denver in early May, and we presented the case. And then three days before our deadline, June 27th, we got the decision. Four judges said we ought to win. 
Four judges said we ought to lose. One judge said we should probably win, but we had to go back down to the district court to the judge who'd ruled against us, one more emergency motion and get some technical things cleared up. So one more emergency motion, one more emergency hearing in Oklahoma City. It's now June 28th. It's the last business day before the fines kick in. And the judge granted it. Hobby Lobby was protected, but only as long as its case went through the court system. And on that morning, we all had a pretty good idea where its case was going to end up. As we worked our way up to the Supreme Court, one of the biggest surprises to me was the government's argument in the case. As a lawyer, I thought the legal analysis is really straightforward. Hobby Lobby was suing under something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. You may have heard about this, you may have heard about the state versions, they've been in the news a lot lately. And under this law, what it says is your religious exercise is substantially burdened, then the government has to justify why it's doing that. The government has to have what's called a compelling interest, a really high level interest to burden religious freedom. And even if it has one of those interests, the government has to look and see if there are any other ways we can do this. Is there a win-win solution here that can allow the government to do what it needs to do but also respects religious exercise? And so that was the argument that we made before the court. We thought the answer was clear. Of course this is a substantial burden, $475 million in fines. And of course the government has lots of other ways that it can do this. This law is one that sets up common sense solutions. It doesn't say the religious people always win, but it says the government has to take their claims seriously and that it has to look for those win-win solutions where it can find them. So the government comes in and tells the courts that they just need to ignore all of that. The government said that when Hobby Lobby Incorporated all those years ago, back in those first stores, that it gave up any right that it had to religious freedom. Hobby Lobby's just a for-profit business, right? It doesn't have any religious freedom. And the Greens, well, they're just shareholders. Never mind that this is their family business that they have built from the ground up, that they still run every day. They don't have any kind of say in how that business is run. Now, this was a pretty scary argument. Taken to its logical conclusion, it would mean that a Christian bookstore couldn't decide on a religious basis what kind of books it was going to stock. It would mean a kosher butcher, if he incorporated, wouldn't be able to make a religious freedom claim if the government came in and tried to stop what he was doing. That's not a hypothetical, by the way. It's actually happened in Denmark and in some other countries to the great detriment of the Jewish communities there. And it was absolutely chilling to me in March to sit in the Supreme Court and to hear Justice Alito pose that very question about the kosher butchers to the government's lead lawyer, the Solicitor General. And the Solicitor General, somebody who surely practiced this, didn't really have a good answer because there wasn't one. That's why you saw groups as diverse as the Christian Booksellers Association, a halal food company, a Mormon publishing company, and Orthodox Jewish rabbis come together at the Supreme Court to support Hobby Lobby because they all understood the stakes. I think the government's argument was actually even more dangerous than people realized because, as you know, many different organizations are incorporated. The government was quick to say, oh, we're just going after the for-profits, it's not the non-profits, y'all are fine. Um, but we know that religious schools are incorporated, hospitals, charities, ministries. If those groups have no religious freedom claims, what's going to happen next? That argument actually lost 7-2 at the Supreme Court. Even two of the justices who thought Hobby Lobby ought to win on the, uh, two of the justices who thought Hobby Lobby ought to lose on the merits weren't willing to go that far and say that a family business had no religious freedom at all. Uh, when I heard the news, I was actually sitting downstairs in the Supreme Court cafeteria. If you're upstairs in the courtroom, you can't use your phone and you can't use your computer. And so we figured out that the best way to get the news was to go and sit and wait in the Supreme Court cafeteria right next to the public information office. And we didn't know when the case was coming out either. So in June, every day, we'd get all dressed up and we would drive down to the court building and we would sit there and wait and wait and wait. And it was the last day of the term. It was June 30th. And we were gathered in the Supreme Court cafeteria, and the Greens were gathered around a conference table at Hobby Lobby headquarters in Oklahoma City. They had it on a speakerphone, and it was really touching to me later um, when I saw the pictures, because I realized that was the same conference room that we'd sat in a few weeks earlier. 
to talk about what would happen if they lost their case. They were there that morning and the decision came out. Hobby Lobby won and they cheered and so did we. And we listened as the uh, court went through the steps one by one. Hobby Lobby did have religious freedom. The Greens hadn't given it up all those years ago. Hobby Lobby was substantially burdened. If 475 millions of dollars in fines isn't a substantial burden, what is? And the government had a lot of other ways to get this done. It didn't need Christians to help it distribute abortion-causing drugs. It was a common sense ruling, and it was a narrow ruling. And many people didn't see it that way. The government certainly didn't. They kept fighting. Um, I will give them credit for this. It takes some kind of nerve to lose to Hobby Lobby and decide that your next fight is going to be against the Little Sisters of the Poor. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. We were back at the Supreme Court last spring under the same law to make sure that the Little Sisters and Colorado Christian University and so many other groups who are out there serving God and serving their neighbors are able to continue doing just that. And we won that one too. Because, and this is the second thing I want to highlight for you today, Victory doesn't mean that the challenges go away. Ezra rebuilt the temple. It was an enormous victory for Israel, but they still needed Nehemiah to build the wall. And Nehemiah faced his greatest challenges after he had already succeeded in part, after most of that wall was up. That's when people started looking to see, and they realized there was a danger. I have been doing this kind of work for 12 years now and our team has won five Supreme Court victories for religious freedom, and our caseload is not one bit smaller. Now, does that mean the victories didn't matter? No, of course not. Where would we be if Hobby Lobby had lost? If it really was the law of the land that you give up your religious freedom the moment you step across and open a business. But our work is often like Nehemiah's. That's when others start to look. That's when others start to plot. That was when leaders started to lie about Nehemiah and threaten him and slander him and claim that he was trying to lead an uprising against the king that he served. Nehemiah's success made him a threat. So what's next? You're all enjoying the cake. Uh, the cake is from Masterpiece Cake Shop here in Denver. Some of you may be familiar um, with that name. It's currently in its own case before the Supreme Court. Masterpiece is owned by Jack Phillips. Mr. Phillips was also asked to make a hard choice. He had to decide if he was going to violate his religious beliefs and how he ran his business. He could not, in good conscience, use his artistic expression to create a wedding cake for a ceremony that was contrary to his beliefs. So he declined to bake a cake celebrating a same-sex marriage. For that, he faces legal penalties and the potential loss of his business. This term, the Supreme Court's going to decide if the law protects his religious expression. The law that protected Hobby Lobby, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, isn't at issue here. That law protects you when the federal government comes in and tries to trample on religious freedom. There are some states that have their own versions of that law, and there are some states that have versions under their state constitutions that are similar, but Colorado is not one of them. And even the states that do have those sort of laws, it's a little bit unsettled. Courts don't always agree on how religious freedom claims fair when there's a claim of discrimination on the other side. In Mr. Phillips' case, with or without a state law, we believe that the Constitution ought to protect his religious exercise. That's what we told the Supreme Court in our brief supporting him. Um, I'm a lawyer, so you get a disclaimer. I am not Mr. Phillips' lawyer. Uh, we're supporting his case with a friend of the court brief. And what we are arguing there is that our nation has a long tradition of ensuring that people don't have to be part of religious ceremonies they disagree with. That was true when our founders excused the Quakers from having to uh, swear oaths. Quakers were a very unpopular religious minority at that point, but they were protected. It was true when states stopped penalizing people for missing church. That really was something you could be in trouble for in the colonial era. And it's also true today. Our nation has thrived on free exercise of religion and on free speech and on letting people who disagree live together in our society. I believe that religious freedom contributes to that thriving. It's not an accident that our nation 
is, has a great deal of religious freedom and also a great deal of success. When you start to restrict that freedom, you're restricting a fundamental right. And if our laws cannot safeguard fundamental rights, we jeopardize the American experiment. We hope that the Supreme Court will continue our long tradition of recognizing religious freedom and free speech by allowing Mr. Phillips to peacefully disagree and bake cakes for anyone who wants them, but not to use his artistic expression to celebrate religious ceremonies that are contrary to his faith. Whichever way the Supreme Court rules, I will give you one guarantee, which is that there will be more cases. We're gonna continue fighting over where these lines are gonna be drawn. So where does that leave us? We have federal laws that protect religious freedom when you run a business. In the states, we have a patchwork of laws that protect it in some cases, not always in others. And the boundaries of those laws are still being tested. We have guarantees of free religious exercise and free speech in our constitution but the courts are still struggling with how to apply those guarantees when they run up against other important interests. When it comes to churches, courts are often really good at protecting their rights. They get it when it comes to churches. But we've seen attempts in recent years to divide churches and other religious organizations, to divide churches on one side and other religious organizations on the other. You remember I mentioned the Little Sisters of the Poor. The Little Sisters are an order of Catholic nuns who serve the elderly poor and our government took the position that they are not a religious employer because they're not a church. Catholic church, you're okay. Catholic nuns, sorry. You don't get as much religious freedom. We can restrict your rights. The government is losing that argument, but the fact that it was even made shows how important it is that we understand that religious freedom does not stop at the church door. If the little sisters of the poor have to fight, you can only imagine the fight that happens when we go beyond a ministry and go into a family business. Many of the disputes in recent years have focused on these questions of how religious freedom plays out in the marketplace. And this is the third point I want to make. You stand at the edge of an important question. Is your faith just what you do on Sunday morning? Or does it impact, does it dictate the way you live your life. You're here today because you know the answer to that question. We need people who know the answer to that question. In today's society, I believe that that idea is at the same time radical and applauded. It's radical because of, as we have seen with Hobby Lobby, it's an idea you have to fight for. It's an idea that can often be ridiculed. But on the other hand, it's often applauded. What do I mean by that? Earlier this year, I was at a dinner in Washington that brought together a very unusual group. They were honoring people who had stood up for freedoms of various sorts, especially First Amendment freedoms, and they were honoring one of my Beckett colleagues. They were also giving an award to Tim Cook. Um, it seemed that a big part of the reason for that award was because Apple had decided to fight government subpoenas uh, that had required it to create a backdoor and break through the privacy of iPhones. And I was so surprised because Tim Cook stood up and he said, companies can and should have values. And of course, at the Beckett table, Monsi and I are elbowing each other saying, where was this when we were fighting Hobby Lobby? Where was the outcry? Because people need values in how they run their businesses. But there's a reason that that speech got a standing ovation from a room full of people who I'd guess three quarters of them would want nothing to do with our victory in Hobby Lobby. People don't want to shut down their values. They don't want to leave their beliefs behind when they go to work in the morning. We as a society don't want people who are going to pack up their moral compass when they pick up their briefcase. We want people to carry their faith, to carry their beliefs with them to work. We want people who will take a stand, even when it proves unpopular, because it's the right thing to do. If only we could all agree on what's the right thing. But this is exactly why our laws must guarantee freedom, especially religious freedom. We live in an increasingly fractured society, and religious freedom offers a way for people of different beliefs to respect each other, to live and to work side by side. Nehemiah was the servant of a pagan king. He went out against the odds through hostile territory, surrounded by people who threatened his very life, and he built what needed to be built. His courage gave his people the freedom to live 
and to worship and to rededicate their lives to God. Sometimes taking that stand is dangerous, as we saw with the Green family and with Hobby Lobby. Other times the path is easier. Other times when you let your light shine before men, they really do see why it was necessary in the first place. There are a lot of examples I could give, many of which I'm sure are here in this room. There was a recent one that stood out to me. I grew up in Texas, and it's been really sad to see the devastation that has happened through Hurricane Harvey. I have friends who've lost possessions, lost schools, places that my family and I used to vacation, flattened. And I've been encouraged and not at all surprised to see the way Texans have come together to serve each other and help each other and help their neighbors. And one of my favorite stories coming out of that, and many of you probably saw this, I was pretty big on the national news for a couple days, is the story of Mattress Mac. Jim Mack and Vale, uh, popularly known as Mattress Mac, owns a chain of furniture stores in Houston. And he's also a faithful Catholic. When the floodwaters rose, Mr. Mack and Vale opened his stores, not to sell mattresses or chairs, but as a shelter for people who had nowhere else to come and sleep. People whose homes were underwater could find a safe place to rest. He estimated that he lost $60,000 for every day that his showrooms were closed to the public, but open to those in need. And if you saw his interview on national news, you heard his voice break when the reporter asked a very simple question. Why would you do this? And he said, because it's the right thing to do. Perhaps you'll be asked to take a risk and step out on faith. Perhaps you'll be asked to bear the slings and arrows of public opinion and everything that happens on Twitter. Or perhaps you'll be hailed for your contributions and for your service, beloved by everyone, albeit at a price. Or perhaps the challenges will be the quiet ones, the hard decisions that we make every day to get out and get the shovel and build what needs building. It wasn't my business that I built for 40 years that was on the line in Hobby Lobby, but it was my fight. And I can tell you about the sleepless nights and the emergencies, there were even more than I covered today, um, and the moments when it seemed like it might all be in vain. But during those moments, there was a song that I just couldn't get out of my head. It was an old hymn that I learned growing up in the Churches of Christ. And one day, as I was going in a meeting, I just scribbled it down on the corner of my legal pad, and I tore off that piece of paper, and I put it in my bag, and I carried it with me. And I carried it with me to meet the Greens, and I carried it with me to the Supreme Court, and I carried it with me for months afterwards, so that I would remember to trust what I could not see. And what I wrote was this. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. I don't know what forms your tests might come in, but I know that your testimony is important and it is necessary. It matters to you because it's part of your own beliefs, but it also matters to our country. The futures of our freedoms will be dependent on people who are committed to living out their faith beyond the four walls of a church. Religious freedom depends on people who are willing to live their faith out loud in public and willing to stand for their beliefs because it's the right thing to do. I am grateful for those of you who are gathered in this room, and I pray that you will have the courage of Nehemiah to face the challenges without fear, to go out every day, and to build what needs building. Thank you. My name is David Himes. I'm an attorney, represent uh, businesses, churches, nonprofits. Um, Jack lost at the administrative level, went up to the Colorado Court of Appeals and lost handedly. That was a very lengthy decision. And our Colorado Supreme Court punted and didn't even take the case. My question for you, predictions. How do you think the Supremes are going to come down on Jack's case? Predictions are a risky business. <laughs> um, you know, I am optimistic about Jack's case. It's always hard to say, I, you know, reading the commentary in the news and people are saying, oh, well, it'll come down to the swing vote to Justice Kennedy. Uh, that may well be the case. Um, but our Supreme Court in recent years has really been strong on issues of free speech. And so I think that you will see this really come down to do they understand this is a free speech case or do they understand it as a discrimination case? 
I think that's really going to be how this decision turns. Um, and I should say free speech and also free exercise case, it is both. Um, but I'm optimistic because the court, uh, and including Justice Kennedy, has shown a real desire in recent years to be strong on protecting free speech. I think it probably will be a close case, but I'm very hopeful. Yeah, Brad. Uh, we're getting all the attorney questions. Brad is also <laughs> an attorney. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, my question is, are there any safe harbors, if you will, that come out of the Hobby Lobby case that a biz Christian business owner can take away from it and say, okay, I'm comfortable now that there's legal cover for this or that? That's a very good question. Um, as what Hobby Lobby established is that you can have a religious freedom claim in a for-profit business, that that right does not go away. Uh, it doesn't always tell us what the outcome of that case is going to be. Now, there's a very good template there. If your religious freedom is substantially burdened, then the government's going to have to take a hard look at what it's doing. The courts are going to take a hard look at what it's doing. Um, but the details of every individual case are going to vary. I think an important thing to understand is that when you're talking about federal laws, they right now at least are a little bit more protective of religious freedom than the laws that we have in some states, including Colorado. We have another question over here. Rick. Thanks, Lori. Um, I own a small business, and I'm not an attorney, but I've been to court a number of times, and I normally settle because I can't afford to take it to that level. How do we as business owners and Christian, Christian business owners fight some of these things? Um, I think that's a great question. That's why groups like Beckett exist. Um, and so what we do is we look for cases that we believe will set good precedent because we want, to want to, we want to win a case, not just for our client, but we want to win a case that's going to set a rule of law that's going to help others as well. And so I would encourage you to look at Beckett, to look at other resources that are out there because there are attorneys out there who are giving their time, both in nonprofits like ours and also in for-profit law firms who are making sure these principles of religious freedom are defended. Lori, my name's Dennis Guzzi. Um, you know, you mentioned a couple of, uh, uh, you know, situations. My question to you is what kinds of situations would be good to help push back governmental encroachment on our, our Christian morals and values? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, it's a big question. You know, it's hard to always know in advance. We didn't know in advance that the um, bureaucrats at HHS were going to do what they did with the HHS mandate, uh, but I would say, What's important to watch for are cases where someone is being penalized pretty directly for their religious exercise. What's also important to watch for is cases where the government starts trying to draw lines. And it says it's okay, it's fine if we treat churches one way, but then religious charities, we can treat you a little differently, educational institutions a little differently, for-profit businesses a lot differently. And so um, I'm giving you the lawyerly answer, right? The vague one that says it depends. But I think that it's really important to watch where the government is trying to draw the lines. Look for those cases because that's where you're going to see the tension points and the important places where we need to make sure that religious freedom continues to be defended. Uh, one more here. Hi there, great presentation, thank you so much. My name is Kathleen Stubbs, and um, one, I, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, so this is gonna be a really probably dumb question, uh, and it's a two-parter. Is So the first one is, this bakery case, could it end up in the Supreme Court, even though it's a state issue, if they can't settle it, could it end up in the Supreme Court? Be the first part. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then secondly, with the appointment of uh, uh, our new Supreme Court judge, you know, replacing Anthony Scalia, do you see that it, it, on these types of cases, really on point of law versus maybe what they're, you know, it, is that do you see more cases being decided in favor of, let's say, the Hobby Lobbies or the Little Sisters of the Poor, et cetera, uh, or our, our local baker um, by, these types of these, you know, Supreme Court justices that say that they're following the letter of the Constitution and the law versus an interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. 
That's a, that's a great question and, uh, and a, a very smart one, not a dumb question at all. So the first question is, yes, once you have exhausted your appeals in the state Supreme Courts, you can also go to the Supreme Court even if you didn't start in federal court. And they are definitely looking at those cases. And um, the second one is that I am very encouraged uh, having Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. He voted in favor of Hobby Lobby. He was uh, wrote a concurrence explaining why Hobby Lobby ought to win. Um, and actually one of my Beckett colleagues testified at his hearing on what a great record he has on religious freedom. And so I'm very hopeful with the current composition of the Supreme Court uh, because they seem to take a very, they seem to have a very clear understanding of what religious freedom means, why it's important to honor these promises that we have had since our very founding. And so I'm encouraged with where we're going. Okay, any other questions? If not, I have a question for you, Lori. Certainly. A couple of years ago when I talked with you and I invited you to come and speak at this event, uh, you were in the midst of the Hobby Lobby case and uh, you couldn't come and I certainly understand that. But uh, in that conversation, if you remember, I asked you a couple of years ago, uh, what's the next big topic that's going to be uh, before us all. And, and you did say that it would be marriage. And sure enough, you were right with the Masterpiece Cake story. What's the next big issue? <laughs> it's one of those times you don't want to be right. We were actually talking about the conflicts between uh, religious liberty and same-sex marriage 10 years ago, and people thought we were crazy. Uh, and then now we've seen that there actually are conflicts. I believe that there are conflicts that can be resolved and be resolved in a way that let people live together and live peacefully. And I hope that's, that's what our courts will do. Um, the next challenge, I think there's two things that I would point to. One of them I've already touched on a couple of times, and that is this idea that you can divide up religious freedom and that you have more in one place than you do in another and that certain organizations are more deserving of it than others. I think that's a conflict we're gonna to continue to see play out. Um, something else that we're really watching carefully is uh, religious schools and education. Um, as, as part of that, what we saw with the HHS mandate and what we've seen elsewhere is uh, the government saying that organizations like Colorado Christian University and Wheaton College, both of whom we represent, were less deserving of religious freedom than the churches that their students attend. And so I think we're going to continue to see attempts to restrict the sphere of religious education. And that's something that uh, we're fighting against and something that I am so honored to see courageous institutions standing up and defending their rights. Help me thank Lori for coming from Washington, D.C.